Hi everybody, welcome to another Spectrum Economics video. Today we're going to be looking at general equilibrium. I've looked at partial equilibrium a few times in the past. I uh, looked at basic demand and supply, looking at it in terms of one market. Today things are going to get a little bit more complicated, a little bit more sophisticated, and also a little bit more mathematical. So just bear that in mind when you're watching the video. There's going to be quite a bit of mathematics involved. Okay, so what is general equilibrium? So partial equilibrium, as I mentioned, is basically looking at one market in isolation, focusing just on quantity and price without any relationship to any other particular market. General equilibrium is considerably more complicated. It looks at numerous markets. So take the example we've got in this picture. So we've got coconuts, bananas, sofas, clothing, refrigerators, and cars. And they've all got a relationship to each other in one way or another. They could be substitutes or they could be complements to each other. So if the price of one increases, it will affect the price and the quantity of something else, even though it may not be obvious at first. So why do we do general equilibrium? General equilibrium is basically really only required when we're looking at very significant impacts. So that would be, for example, there could be a policy that affects the whole country. Or it could be a very, very large project or very large group of projects or part of a program. Take, for example, we have fiscal policy. So what could we do there? So we're going to spare increased government expenditure on a particular thing. So we're going to invest another, let's say, 20 billion in schools, for example. What is the impact on that to the whole economy? It's very difficult just to analyze that using a simple cost-benefit analysis or a simple partial equilibrium. Again, what if we uh, look at monetary policy? What happens if interest rates go up by 2%? Again, interest rates affects all forms of investment. It also affects consumption as well. In a sense, you're looking at uh, credit card interest rates, look at mortgage interest rates, and so on and so forth. So it affects a very wide number of things. And that's where your general equilibrium comes into it. Also, general equilibrium is also part of what we call an economic impact assessment. And that goes into what we call an economic impact statement. So what does an economic impact statement tell us? What are the general outputs that you get out of general equilibrium? So, for example, it will tell you a change of employment. It could tell you the change in unemployment. So how many jobs will be created by a particular investment? How many jobs will be created by a particular policy? How many jobs will be lost by that particular policy? What impact is that going to have on exports? What impact is that going to have your, on your gross domestic product or your gross state product? So generally, these very broad indicators will come out of your general equilibrium analysis. And there's a few ways of going about general equilibrium. You can use a computable general equilibrium model. It's a very, very sophisticated model. Or you could also use input-output models, also fairly sophisticated, not quite to the same level as a computable general equilibrium model. Both of these, as I mentioned before, are quite expensive to conduct and also can be very time consuming. Today I'm going to explain general equilibrium in the context of something very simple, what we call the Robinson Crusoe model. So what is the Robinson Crusoe model? Many of you have heard the tales of Robinson Crusoe. He, he's a young lad who's on a ship and his ship crashes and he's shipwrecked. So he's left on this island all by himself. Well, not quite all by himself. I think he meets a few friends then he meets a parrot and a warthog and I think maybe a porcupine and a hedgehog. But in terms of humans, anyway, he's all by himself. So Robinson Crusoe, he still has needs and he still has wants. But now he has to basically sort everything out himself. So what Robinson Crusoe can do is he can go and pick various things. He can go and pick coconuts, for example, as food. He can go and get wood and cut down trees to build himself shelter. He can collect stones to also enhance his shelter. He could do various number of other things as well. He can collect vines and ropes to try and pull everything together. He can build his own tools. But he's got to allocate time to doing all of that. And also he has to know his own preferences as well. What, what does he prefer? Does he prefer to have a very nice shelter? Then maybe he'd dedicate more time into that. Or does he prefer to have bananas or maybe coconuts or maybe pineapples? Let's take a look at the mathematics behind this now. So some of you might be familiar with this. It's what we call a utility function. And typically in our Robinson Crusoe model, we use what we call a Cobb-Douglas utility function. So that's basically a multiplicative um, function. It's, it's, rather e it's a bit easier to calculate. It's easier. And also it explains the relationship between various 
goods. For example, in this case, we've got coconuts and bananas. So if you had zero coconuts, effectively we're saying you would die. You need to have the nutritional value from a coconut as well as that of a banana. But there's also difference in preferences as well that may affect the combinations of coconuts and bananas. So let's take a look at our utility functions. So we've got coconuts to the power of half, the square root. Also, we've got bananas uh, to the power of half. So what you can do is you can use differential calculus. So we use uh, partial differentiation. We use that for coconut and we use that for banana, as you can see from the equations here. As it turns out, the optimal number of coconuts and number of bananas for Robinson Crusoe in this case is the same. So if, for example, you can have five coconuts and five bananas, you would pick that over maybe seven coconuts and three bananas. And we can actually prove that as well using the following table. In this table, we have uh, various combinations of coconuts and bananas. As you can see, as we increase it, so you've got one banana, one coconut, one util, or one measure of utility, we call them utils. Two bananas, two coconuts, two. Two utils, three bananas, three coconuts, two, and so on and so on. So we get up to five, which gives us five utils. So what happens, so we've got ten altogether, right? So that's five plus five. What if we have 4.9 bananas and 5.1 coconuts? You can see we get use, less utility. If you have 5.1 bananas and 4.9 coconuts, again, we have less utility. This is an indication that having the exact same number of bananas and coconuts gives us the maximum amount of utility uh, based on that utility function that I showed you just now. Let's quickly take a look at another table, again explaining the effect of diminishing um, utility. So as we mentioned before, one coconut, one banana, one util, two coconuts, two bananas, two utils. So there's no diminishing utility there. But if you only increase the number of one of the fruit, so for example, if you increase the number of coconuts, as you can see, one banana, one coconut, sorry, yep, one banana, one coconut gives you one util. If you add another two coconuts and no bananas, your utility is increased to 1.7. And then if you add another two coconuts and no additional bananas, it increases to 2.236. You add another two coconuts, your utility increases to 2.64. As you can see, utility is diminishing because the ideal mix of bananas and coconuts is approximately equal. So as you get further and further away from that, the yes utility you're going to get from adding the, um, the fruit that, um, that you have the most of. So in this case, you keep adding more and more coconuts. You, your overall utility per extra coconut you're adding is falling. So ideally, you want to keep the number of bananas and coconuts roughly the same. So far, we've only covered one side of the equation, and that's utility. So as I mentioned before, in terms of utility, under no constraints whatsoever, ideally, Robinson Crusoe would want the same number of bananas as there are coconuts. So you'd rather have five bananas and five coconuts than 10 coconuts and no bananas. So what have we got now with the constraint? So with this constraint, as you can see here, you've got 2 times coconut plus banana equals 10. So what does that mean? So imagine 10 is 10 hours. Robinson Crusoe has 10 hours of, let's say, daylight that he can actually do some collecting of bananas and coconuts. So we've got the 2 there for coconut. That means it takes Robinson Crusoe 2 hours to get one coconut. Whereas it only takes him one hour to get one, to get one banana. As you can see, he's far more efficient at collecting bananas. So how does that affect the number of coconuts and the number of bananas that Robinson Crusoe collects and the number of coconuts and bananas that he eats? So assume that Robinson Crusoe eats all his bananas and all the coconuts he collects. So we're adding this production function. As you can see here, we do then partial differentiation again using both coconuts and bananas. And this time round, you can see that Robinson Crusoe would actually collect twice as many bananas as he would coconuts. So as we work out the mathematics, so that's four coconuts equals to ten. So ten divided by four gives us two and a half coconuts. We substitute that number of coconuts into our constraint. So we have two times two and a half coconuts plus a banana. So we rearrange it. So therefore, we get 2 times 2 and a half, that equals to 5. So then 10 minus 5, so we have 5 bananas. So now Robinson Crusoe would have 5 bananas and 2 and a half coconuts. That's not ideal in terms of maximizing utility, 
That's the best you can get, though, considering how much more effort it requires to collect coconuts than it does bananas. So once we've got the number of bananas, number of coconuts, we can substitute that into the art utility function and actually calculate the number of utils. So in this case, we get just over three and a half utils for five bananas and two and a half coconuts. So I'll prove now with tables that this is actually the optimal number of coconuts and bananas. So five bananas and two and a half coconuts will give Robinson Crusoe 3.53 utils. So what if he now collects 5.2 bananas and 2.4 coconuts? So he's dedicated more time to bananas because he can collect more and less to the coconuts. So it's about twice as much time. So what have we got now? So it's the same amount of time, but he gets twice as many bananas, I apologize. So he reduces the number of coconuts by 0.1 and increases the number of bananas by 0.2. But as we can see, his utility actually falls slightly. So spending more time collecting bananas is not an optimal use of his time. How about he spends more time collecting coconuts? After all, Robinson Crusoe's ideal combination of bananas and coconuts is roughly 1 is to 1. So now Robinson Crusoe collects 2.6 coconuts, a 0.1 of a coconut more and he collects 0.2 of a banana less, as again requires twice the amount of effort to collect coconuts. And you can see the utility falls again, so now it drops down to 3.5.327, which is slightly less than our combination of 5 bananas and 2.5 coconuts. So as you can see, using our utility function and constraint, we can calculate the optimal number of bananas and coconuts given uh, the limitations that Robinson Crusoe has in regards to collecting coconuts. So what if Robinson Crusoe discovered a new method of collecting coconuts? And this happens in the real world. There are technology improvements all the time. And you can use general equilibrium analysis to actually calculate what the impact on society would be from those improvements in technology. You can get the number of uh, the new figures for employment, you can get the new figures for output. So in our simple Robinson Crusoe model, we're only looking at coconuts and bananas. So now Robinson Crusoe can more efficiently collect coconuts. He can now spend only one hour collecting coconuts, which is exactly the same as the amount of time required to collect bananas. So considering that coconuts and bananas give um, Robinson Crusoe the same amount of utility, and also because coconuts and bananas now require the same amount of time to collect, Robinson Crusoe can now collect the, his optimal level of bananas and coconuts. So he can collect five coconuts and five bananas. So let's just see how that works out in the table below. So as mentioned earlier, five bananas and five coconuts gives Robinson Crusoe a utility of five. So now what if um, Robinson Crusoe decides he wants to dedicate more time to collecting coconuts? So now he has 5.1 coconuts and 4.9 bananas. Remember, it's exchanged one for one. So his utility actually drops to 4.99. The same happens if Robinson Crusoe now collects more bananas and less coconuts. Utility starts to fall. So as you can see, we're back to the optimal level of utility from an equal number of bananas to coconuts. And that's because the level of production in regards to coconuts is the same. One hour to collect coconuts, one hour to collect bananas. Let's now present our results in a graph. So what we have here is the production possibility frontier, and we also have indifference curves. Okay, so what is a production possibility frontier? So that is basically all the levels of output that can be produced with a particular level of technology. So anything that falls on that frontier is what we call productive efficient. So in effect, you can't use your resources in any other better way. So as you can see here, our initial production Possibility frontier, you can have 10 bananas and 0 coconuts, or you can have 5 coconuts and 0 bananas, or you can have a combination of the two. As we calculated before, our optimal number of bananas and coconuts was 5 bananas and 2.5 coconuts. And then once the production possibility uh, frontier shift out, you can actually reach a higher level of satisfaction. And that's what the indifference curves represent. So we've got indifference curve 1. So that would have given us 3.5, I think it was, uh, utils. And we've got indifference uh, curve 2, which gives us about 5 utils. And because of this shift in the production possibility frontier, Robinson Crusoe can now achieve a higher level of utility. So he could still have his 5 bananas, but now he can get an additional 2.5 coconuts. 
What's also interesting here as well, I didn't mention earlier, is that Robinson Crusoe still dedicates the exact same amount of time to collecting bananas as collecting coconuts. He dedicates five hours to collecting bananas, which gives him five bananas, and five hours to collecting coconuts. Previously, he would have only got 2.5 coconuts with that time. Now he gets five coconuts with that time. So you can see he's doubled his output, but the amount of time spent has not changed. Generally, equilibrium can actually show you the changes in terms of time allocated towards specific activities. In this case, you kept it very simple using very simple equations that those numbers didn't in fact actually change. I'm now going to explain a very simple input-output model. So it's very similar to general equilibrium models. It's along the same premise that you're not just looking at one market, but you're looking at multiple markets, markets and look across multiple industries. So let's take, we've got two industries here. We've got industry A and industry B. So in order to produce outputs, industry A requires inputs from firms within industry A and also firms within industry B, as you can see here. So to produce one dollar of output requires 60 cents worth of input from A and 30 cents worth of input from B. And the same with um, industry B requires 20 cents of inputs from A and 50 cents of inputs from B. So what happens now if there's a dollar increase in output for industry A? So immediately you'll add that dollar increase from industry A. But you have to remember to add the increase in all of the inputs that go into industry A. So industry A takes 60 cents from other firms as inputs. So that takes us up to the $1 of output increase plus an additional 60 cents. That $1 input also required input from B as well. So we've got another additional 32 cents from B. And then that will continue on to the next round. And this will keep continuing until we get down to zero. So you get the initial $1 increase, and then you get the increase in production from A, which requires more inputs from A and more inputs from B. Then there's also the increase in production of B that also requires more inputs from A and more inputs from B. So it keeps going and going and going. But as we go through, as we call it in this case, rounds, the amount of output is slowly but surely decreasing. So you've got this sort of multiplier effect. So instead of having just a $1 increase in A, you add it up, you've actually got a $1.70 increase in A, as well as about a $0.34 cent increase in B. So if a similar thing happens if there's an increase in output of $1 industry B. So again, we're taking output from industry A, and we're also taking output from industry B as well. And you say, again, it works out. So you get about another $1.60 from B, and about another almost $0.50 cents from A. So here's a table just quickly summarizing what we get from the input-output table. So if there's an increase in price of $1 for industry A, you'll see outputs from B increase by $170. So that is a direct $1 output plus all the intermediate outputs plus some additional final output as well. And you also get some outputs from B as well as then the outputs from B go into A. And also some of the outputs to produce B also goes into it gets quite confusing but you get a total increase of output of over two dollars again if we look at industry b a one dollar increase so we get additional outputs from a that amounts to about 48 cents additional outputs from b which is about 160 so again that 160 is the one dollar direct input output plus an extra 60 cents for producing any additional outputs of a and b that goes into that initial one dollar output so you can see here, we get an additional $2, so we get additional, yeah, $2.08. Interestingly enough, by an increase of $1 in industry B, we get a slightly higher net effect than a $1 increase in industry A. And that's simply because industry B has a higher requirement, percentage requirement of industry A than what industry A has of B. So there's different level of connectivity. So you'll see more growth in your economy by actually seeing a higher output of B produced than you would of A. So this more or less brings me to the end of this video. If there's just one thing I'd like you to take away from this video, and that is that basically everything is connected. So we talk about partial equilibrium, and that is generally fairly easy to do. And that gives us a broad idea of how the concepts work. But generally, equilibrium goes a lot more detailed than that, and it looks at the relationships between various markets and various industries.
But the very big downside, though, of general equilibrium is the fact that the models are very sophisticated and very complicated, and also it is very expensive to run these models. It's very time consuming, especially when you've got to collect a lot of data. So it's only used on occasions when something very big is happening, whether it's a big policy change or it's going to be rather large change in fiscal policy, a massive amount of money has been expected to be spent in one area or produced in one area. Or you look at it in terms of like very large changes in um, interest rates and stuff like that, things that affect the economy in a very big way, generally equilibrium is it, recommended. Other than that, we still probably keep more with our partial equilibrium analysis, but sometimes it's good to just look at things like I mentioned in a previous video about complements and substitutes, just to be aware of what those are. So rather than doing a full general equilibrium analysis, really just look at some of the um, other goods and services that are related in one way or another. Anyway, thank you for uh, listening to this video. If you're watching this on DTube, I would appreciate it if you would give me an upvote. And if you're not already following me, to remember to follow me. I have a lot of other content on my page as well. I've got posts, blogs, uh, some pictures, I've got some memes. I run contests as well. So if you're interested in any of that stuff, remember to um, follow and uh, check out my page. If you're watching us on YouTube, also remember to, f to follow if, if you're not already following. Anyway, thank you for watching the video and goodbye.